Greetings everyone from the Display Week 2022 show floor and welcome to episode number 17 of the Display Show. I'm Brian Berkeley, your host, coming to you live from the Nanasys booth at Display Week and today's guest is Ross Young. Ross is well known throughout the display industry. He is co-founder and CEO of Display Supply Chain Consultants. Previously, he started and ran Display Search, which he started with less than $500 in capital. And by the time he was done with it, it was earning over 10 million in revenue. He also worked throughout the display supply chain, including at a TV brand, a panel supplier, multiple equipment suppliers, and a material supplier. Ross has also authored a book on U.S.-Japan semiconductor competition, and he was addicted to racing and triathlons for four years. Ross, welcome to the Display Show. It's a pleasure to be here, Brian. Thank you for inviting me. You know, I think we've known each other for 20 years, almost, and so it's great to be here live. This is only the second live show that we've done uh, on the Display Show. And, um, you know, we've both been involved in the industry a long time, and uh, one of the things that you do for SID is each year you, you chair the business conference. Earlier this week, at your opening keynote for the business conference for SID 2022, you referred to 2021 as being the best of times mm -hmm. and 2022 as being the worst of times for the display industry. That's right. Can you elaborate on that and sure. tell us why? Well, in 2021, uh, as the pandemic continued, um, the IT market overperformed. Uh, we had very strong demand. Prices were going up. Prices went up dramatically, well over 150% in some cases. And at the same time, we had double-digit unit growth. So strong demand, high prices, tight supply. It was a great year for the display industry. Record profits, record margins. But unfortunately, the market got saturated at around the middle of last year. And then prices started to come down. And now we have all of these economic shocks happening with Russia, Ukraine, China shutdowns, and prices are continuing to fall and demand is falling as well. So we have lower units, lower prices. We, we saw the industry add a lot of capacity when prices were high. So now we have all this extra capacity and demand is dropping, creating a wider surplus between supply and demand. And prices have already fallen below cost and are approaching cash costs. So it's, it's a painful time for the display industry at, at this moment. I've got to ask about that. How long do you think it's going to take before this works itself out and we can get to a better part of, we used to call it the crystal cycle. I That's guess we right. should just call it the display cycle because it's not just LCDs. Um, when do you think this will shake out? And get well, better? what's happened in the past is it's always been darkest before the dawn. The low prices stimulate demand. We have an elastic response to these low prices. Demand goes up. And prices start to go up and the industry rebounds. But right now, because of high inflation and the China shutdowns, people aren't buying. Um, so the prices are going to have to continue to fall uh, in order to stimulate demand. So the good news is for consumers, for buyers of displays in TVs and notebooks, they're going to, in monitors, they're going to see lower and lower prices. Um, and that should be welcomed. Uh, especially since they're having to pay more for everything else, like gas prices and food. Uh, displays have traditionally always gone down. They, uh, in terms of TV prices, they went up year over year last year for the very first time. T the TV industry has constantly brought lower prices, and we're going to see that again. Um, so prices usually don't fall much below cash costs because then you're just attaching money every time you sell a product. Right. Um, so we think. Maybe by the end of the year, prices will bottom out, and as these economic shocks go away, as China resumes normal business, as demand returns, prices will come back up and the display industry will start growing again. And we see a lot of growth coming in the display industry. Uh, great products, that are that, great display technologies like we see here, as well as in things like AR, VR. Um, people are gonna be buying more of those, we think. Performance is gonna continue to get better automotive, other areas like that. We're seeing more displays per car, bigger displays per car. Manufacturers are really improving display technology, giving brands more and more choices. And uh, we think eventually the display industry will be rewarded and we'll see higher growth. Well, your company, 
DSCC for short, mm -hmm. uh, has a track record of uh, accurate we forecasts so. yes. uh, mm -hmm. compared to just about everybody else. So Thank you. do you think it will be more healthy in 2023, 2024? Roughly, what's the time frame for a return to normalcy or at least moderate health for the display industry? Yeah, if we look at the market on a sequential basis quarterly, you know, we, we start to see it uh, rebound at the, end of, uh, at the end of this year into next year. Um, and actually, it's kind of funny, the revenue forecast looks like a sine wave. So we're kind of in the downturn now and it'll bottom up and come back up. Um, but we don't see prices getting back to where they were last year. That was an unusual situation. Um, because of work from home and learn from home, people were trying to replicate their office setups at, at home. It led to a real strong surge in demand uh, for IT products. And people were wanting, and they knew they weren't going to go out and travel, so they bought better TVs. Um, so we may not see that kind of demand in the, the typical mature markets like IT and TVs like we've seen in the past. But we see some new, new markets coming to, to help uh, absorb some of this capacity. Um, and, uh, but we definitely see the market getting healthier over the next few years. We think it'll remain cyclical. Uh, we won't see a downturn as, as deep as we're seeing now. Um, and we won't see growth as high as we've seen, but we'll get back to where we were in terms of total revenues in a few years. Uh, the industry grew like 31% last year to 164 billion. Uh, we think we'll get back to 164 billion in a few years. You know, it's amazing to think. I remember when it was a big deal that the display industry crossed 100 billion, mm -hmm. and now it's grown to something even much larger than that. Uh, yeah. But it's no, no small business. This is a big business. I remember when it got to 10 billion, and I remember when the first 15 inch LCD monitor got to 999. I mean, that was a big day. I felt like this industry was going to make it when we got to 999 for 15 inch. Now those are like 199 or $99. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, we're here on the Display Week exhibit floor, uh, right in the middle of it all. And I'm wondering what you've seen here, either on the show floor or at the conference at any presentation or otherwise, uh, that you think is exciting. Uh, There's so many things to choose from. Um, you know, that's what's amazing at this conference in this exhibit is you're seeing products that you're not going to see at CES or in or on store shelves for years. This is a great way to, to get a sneak peek as to what's, what's gonna come in the future. So we're seeing uh, bigger and brighter OLED TVs. We're seeing more flexible and foldable and rollable products. Um, it's really an exciting time to be a display buyer. You have all these different technologies coming to market that are better than, than what we've had in the past. And we know prices are coming down. There's gonna be a lot of competition amongst these uh, different technologies. And uh, you know, the consumer is going to ultimately benefit and can count on better and better displays at lower and lower prices. Um, so it's a, it's a great time to be a buyer and user of displays. And you know, just looking at these displays, I mean, these are tremendous. Um, I mean, OLED performance continues to get better. What we've seen with QD OLED, it's really amazing in terms of brightness and HDR and color performance and viewing angles. Um, you know, it, it's a great time to be buying displays. I've talked to people on the show floor who are from major integrators and mm -hmm. all kinds. I mean, there are TV set makers who are here. There's uh, Tesla. Uh, earlier today, I spoke to a, a gentleman from Tesla, from Apple, from HP, from IT companies. Uh, all manner of people are here in Silicon Valley. Uh, and they're all very impressed with continuous innovations and improvements that are being made to these, these devices. They just keep getting better. Right. Uh, and uh, that's part of what drives the industry. Um, but there's also new applications that are happening, and, and uh, that's exciting. In fact, I was going to ask you, you know, what you think are the hottest display or hottest areas for displays over the next few years. Yeah, if we look at revenue growth, we see um, small, medium displays used in applications like VR and AR. Uh, enjoying double-digit revenue growth. We see automotive growing close to double-digit to double digit levels. And, uh, you know, it's very exciting because we don't really know how AR, VR is going to work out. It's not a uh, very predictable space. It's going to depend on that killer device, you know, like we saw with, uh, you know, when Apple invented the iPhone and the, and the iPad. People didn't know what those were going to do and, until the product was invented and people really embraced it. So now we're in 
uh, we're in this era of these new devices, these new headsets coming, and we don't know which one's really going to be a big hit in the market and potentially replace the smartphone and drive you know, millions of units. So it's, it's, uh, we're seeing tremendous investment by Facebook or Meta and Google and Apple and Snap, and inevitably we're going to see something that's going to be a hit with uh, industry and with consumers. One thing we've seen a lot of uh, here on the show floor in various places are these new QD OLED uh, displays. So in this booth, uh, for instance, there's a 34-inch gaming monitor on the other side of the wall, and right behind us we have uh, the white OLED that's the flagship for OLED TV in the market today, but also behind me is the uh, QD OLED set. Um, and these exhibits, this space that we're sitting in right here has been drawing a ton of attention. I wonder what you think of the QD OLED. Um, you know, I have the wide OLED TV, and uh, you know, I really think it's a great set, but at the same time, you do notice some shortcomings, and I think the QD OLED has really targeted those shortcomings and basically becomes the perfect TV. So, the you know, wide OLED in, uh, in a bright room kind of washes out. Um, you don't have that issue to the same extent with QD OLED. Uh, the color saturation uh, becomes more limited in, in high brightness. Um, it images and you don't really see that with QD OLED. Um, viewing angle is better. Um, so I think they've really addressed some of the shortcomings with OLED TV and produced a better OLED TV. I think they're both very attractive, but the difference is quite notable on these sets. Now with Samsung moving into OLED TV, and I'm talking uh, not just in terms of the display company, but uh, Samsung Electronics. Uh, and with LG Electronics moving into quantum dot based LCDs, uh, much faster than I think anybody had predicted, I'm seeing kind of a, a technology convergence, or at least the possibility of a technology convergence where manufacturers used to hang their hat on one specific type of technology, but now maybe they're trying different kinds. And I wonder if you're seeing that crossover and what you make of that. Yeah, a couple of years ago at SID in the business conference, I gave a talk and I said that um, we're in this new phase of technology choice, um, not just in terms of display technology, but the substrate as well. So now for the first time, there are so many technology choices in displays and it's so much easier for brands to differentiate. Um, they can introduce quantum dot LCD, quantum dot OLED, white OLED, uh, rigid displays in, in IT, we're seeing flexible and foldable and rollables coming. We've seen a lot of rollable demos. So it, it's, a, it's you know, very exciting to see all of this technology competition, display technology competition in all of these different applications. In, in the past, it was just you know, how, many would, how many do you want of these amorphous silicon basic displays? Right. And now you have all of this choice. It's very easy to differentiate as a brand. Panel suppliers are offering their customers uh, the best technologies and brands are enjoying these uh, better technologies and offering their customers more choice. And, and they're going to let the customer decide which is, which is um, ultimately going to win in terms of price and performance. So it's no surprise with the um, incredible brightness and um, color performance with quantum dots that we're seeing more quantum dot penetration in uh, different applications and different display technologies. You know, I'm kind of interested to see how the brands manage the messaging yeah. around all the different technologies. What, what do you expect they'll do to, to message out to the consumer? Yeah, that can be very confusing. Uh, we've seen that in the past with different uh, acronyms being used and you know, too many acronyms. Um, you know, the reviewers do a good job of explaining it. Um, but yeah, it's going to be up to the brands, given all these different technology choices, to convey that value to the consumer. Yeah. Now, I, I want to talk with you about OLED panel production for a mm -hmm. moment. Okay. Um, I, I've seen that, you know, currently when we, when we talk about small size, there's one dominant manufacturer. And then for large sizes, there's another different, but also dominant manufacturer. And I wonder if you see other panel makers uh, making stronger moves to get into OLED production so there's more of a choice for the brands uh, uh, to expand uh, the opportunity to have OLED competition that expands that market. What do you think? I think that would be very helpful to help grow the segment. You know, currently we have LG display with six times uh, more capacity than Samsung display in OLED uh, for television and monitors. Um, 
and we don't really see those numbers changing very much in terms of more capacity coming, which means prices are going to stay high and not narrow the gap with LCDs, um, which will limit the growth of the segment. What could help accelerate the growth of the segment from a supply standpoint would be more suppliers entering. We see white OLED and quantum dot, or we see white OLED displays and inkjet printing OLED displays at the show from Chinese suppliers like BOE and China Star. But at the moment, we're not expecting uh, any new capacity coming from them to, to enter OLED TV panel production in the next couple of years. So it, the industry is going to be limited uh, to what Samsung and LG produce. Um, and uh, you know, that's going to uh, maintain their premium position in the market. And uh, I don't think we're going to see big price reductions uh, anytime soon. So if you want an OLED TV, uh, don't wait for lower prices because they're not going to get lower very soon. I see. Um, yeah. yeah, in the, in the China Star, for instance, booth, which is just right next to us, uh, I took a look. They were showing a, a prototype. It's not in mass production. But to your earlier point, you get to see earlier technology that will be in products within some number of years. Uh, and they had a 65-inch uh, inkjet printed OLED. Um, it's pretty impressive. They, they wouldn't commit a mass production date for the panel. Right. But, uh, and it was 8K as well. Right. But uh, in a week, it might not look as good. Right. So yeah, That's the question. And, and that's always important. You've got to have all of the brightness and the color coordinates and uh, the reliability, uh, you know, image sticking free. Uh, and so it remains to be seen. But, but there are folks who are expanding the technologies. What about small size uh, OLED panel production? Is the uh, is there going to continue to be one dominant supplier there, or will we see multiple suppliers for you know cell phones, mobile phones, uh, tablets, uh, smaller devices? It's a very exciting space to watch because you have you know five to ten players and one dominant player. So how does that how will that change over time? Um, you know, Samsung Display is doing what it can to stay ahead of the competition and maintain its attractive margins, but you have subsidized, lower cost manufacturers in, in China who are trying to win that business over. So it's, it's incredible to see how much, different, how much innovation there has been in mobile OLEDs, uh, because that's what's necessary for Samsung to stay ahead of BOE and LG Display and China Star and Tianma and Visionox. There are many players, but Samsung, like you said, is the dominant player uh, with 60% plus market share. Um, six zero? Six, six zero. Wow, sixty yes. percent. Yeah. And and China has spent tens of billions of dollars and combined has about twenty percent market share or less than twenty percent market share. So Samsung has to continue to to innovate, stay ahead of the competition, and give reasons for their customers to pay more to buy from Samsung than to pay less and buy from other suppliers. And and they've also got the best manufacturing in addition to the best device performance. And so if you buy from Samsung, you know you're gonna, you're gonna get higher yields, you know you're gonna get your deliveries on time. Um, there's less uncertainty. Um, but you would think that uh, in this commodity market that the lower price player would eventually take more share, but it's, it, the burden is on Samsung to stay ahead and they've uh, accepted that challenge and, and exceeded expectations. Well, you bring up a really good point, and it's one that I was going to mention also, but not just the innovation in the panel technology itself, uh, you know, whether that's camera behind the display, or there's, there's like a dozen innovations we can mention just off the bat, but uh, also the innovation in value engineering, uh, as well as the innovation in manufacturing technology uh, to get very high yields, uh, especially as the devices get more and more complex. Um, this is something that requires a lot of know-how, and I'm wondering if that know-how is something that might be holding back some of the newer players as they try to expand their market share and the small size. Sure. Um, Samsung wisely built up a, a large amount of capacity in rigid OLEDs, so they focused on making rigid OLEDs and, and had a lot of success early on and achieved very high volume and very high yields. Um, their competition sort of skipped over rigid OLEDs. And so then they had the challenge of having to master the OLED portion of the process, the front plane process, as well as the flexible back plane, which is also very challenging. So they had two very difficult tasks 
uh, challenges to overcome at the same time while Samsung sort of did it step by step. First we'll do OLEDs, then we'll do flexible with OLEDs, while the Chinese went straight to flexible OLEDs and really suffered with their yields um, and still are not close to where Samsung is. Um, so, and, when we, and we've seen Samsung noticing that the Chinese are starting to catch up and so then they constantly in innovate with things like touch on TFE, adding the touch sensor, uh, low temperature polysilicon oxide so you can do variable refresh and reduce the power. Um, many other innovations coming like tandem uh, OLED stacks and they, they've also succeeded with color on encapsulation starting with the Z Fold 3 and micro lens arrays starting with the um, S21 and S22 Ultras. These are things that are only available from Samsung display and really maximize the performance in terms of brightness and power consumption and things like that. So it's Samsung is a really tough competitor. So not just uh, Chinese entrants, but also there's LG, LG Display. Uh, do you see them as becoming a, a force within the smaller size panels? They are um, improving their quality and are good enough to be the second supplier at Apple who has very discerning quality standards. Yes. But they are not expanding capacity enough to, to, to sell beyond Apple at this point. And in fact, their future investments are not really around smartphones, they're more around iPads uh, and notebooks. So, you know, they're looking to s supply Apple in other applications rather than win more smartphone business. Okay. Um, I want to go back to QD OLED for a moment. I didn't prepare you in advance with this question, but I wonder if you see uh, Samsung Display as expanding uh, the size of available options uh, with QD OLED, and of course that would require new fab investment. Do uh, you have any uh, inside information or G2 on that for us? Uh, we think that they will uh, add two new sizes without adding a new fab actually, uh, doing what's called multi-mother glass where they make multiple sizes, two sizes on the same piece of glass. So they'll add like a 49 inch and a 77 inch. So they will expand their product line, which is important because LG's done a good job with that, adding 42 and 48 and, and uh, 77, 85 I believe, or another size. Um, so uh, that will give customers more choice, which is important. Uh, in terms of expanding capacity, we think that, that they will be able to expand capacity at their existing fab without uh, significant uh, additional CapEx by um, uh, simplifying the stack, uh, going from three to four OLED layers to two OLED layers as phosphorescent blue OLED emitters uh, come to market. Uh, that will allow uh, the evaporation tool to, to generate twice as much output. Right. Um, and then they could order more backplane equipment. Um, and so you don't really need a new building or a new fab to really increase the capacity to, say, uh, double what they have now. But in terms of a new line, I think they're waiting till they get to a, a higher yield number, um, get the cost down a little more, uh, make the product a little more profitable. Samsung has very high margin standards. Uh, before ex uh, justifying expansion. Um, so I think it, the, the onus is on them to, to prove that, that, that it can be a more profitable product. Oh, that'd be interesting to see if they're going to move beyond the 34 monitor and the uh, 55, 65 that they have uh, for TV. Um, so what about other trends? Do you see any other significant trends uh, occurring in the display industry? Uh, we watch the uh, foldable and rollable markets very closely. Uh, that will be one area of rapid growth this year. You know, I talked about that it's a bad year. Well, foldable smartphones will still grow 100%. Um, so that's that, not bad. That's not bad. <laughs> and, uh, you know, mini LEDs are going to grow over 100% as well. I mean, Apple introduced those in late 2021. Now they'll have a full year to run with their iPad Pro and their MacBook Pro. With so you mean mini, mini LED backlights? Yes, for mini LEDs, LEDs as backlight. opposed to mini LED emitter that's right. displays. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we're seeing more mini LED devices, more LCD TVs with mini LED backlights. Um, and in monitors, that's an interesting area. It's kind of an area where there's uh, not enough OLED options. I mean, there are, there are too many OLED options, but not enough really good options. So, <laughs> like, so for example, wide OLED and QD OLED are great for TV, but they're a little low resolution today for, um, for monitors. You can't get to 4K below 40 inches. So that 27 inch 4K or 32 inch 4K market is not really available uh, to white OLED or QD OLED at the moment. Um, and in monitor sizes. In monitors, yes. Yeah. 
and inkjet printing OLED, it's a little dim um, and capacity is quite limited. So we don't see a real viable OLED option today for high volume in monitors. But what we're seeing is a lot of uh, uh, activity regarding building next generation fabs, Gen 8.5 fabs with IGZO backplanes instead of LTPS or LTPO backplanes, which means you'll have many fewer mass and you'll have a lot lower costs on the backplane. And the mobility is also improving very, very rapidly. So you won't lose very much by going to IGZO. Um, if it can be manufactured at high yields, it's still a question mark. But we're seeing a lot, in, the mini LEDs from Apple use Oxide or IGZO backplanes uh, in their MacBook Pros, and those are relatively higher mobility. So we're seeing a lot, of, a lot of activity there, and we think we could see the same technology that we see in smartphones, RGB OLEDs, uh, side by side, in increasingly in monitors, in notebooks, and maybe even in TVs someday. So you'll get even brighter displays, um, you know, 1800, 2000 nits, and uh, very, very high resolution. You could even achieve you know, 16K at 55 inch. So that may be a long-term uh, option as the costs come down. So that's most of what I had hoped to cover today. But Ross, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Um, let's see. So I provide a lot of free information about the display industry on my Twitter feed, which is at DSCC Ross. And I'd encourage anyone that's passionate about the display industry to follow me. We, have... will, we will put your Twitter feed and the URL for DSCC here. Great. Um, okay. But what's the best way for viewers to access DSCC information? I would go to the Twitter feed uh, at DSCC Ross and there would be links to uh, our data and press releases and cool things to see about what's going on in displays. I've uh, tweeted out a lot of the cool exhibits here, uh, videos and, and images, uh, giving people the latest and greatest things that's been uh, going on in the, in the display industry. And we encourage everybody to come to uh, display Week 2023, which will be in Los Angeles next year. Uh, and uh, go to the SID.org website. You can find out about that. Ross, it has been great to talk with you here today uh, and our first live interview ever from Display Week. Cool. Uh, thanks for being our guest. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, that's all for today, folks. Please don't forget to subscribe and click the bell for notification when new episodes are released. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. That's fun.